lecture and we discuss some network theorems and network functions in this lecture. One of the network theorems that is not very familiar to many of the electrical engineers is an elementary one which we shall use today and this is called the compensation theorem. Have you heard of this earlier? No. Well, <coughs> it has two versions compensation theorem. We require the elementary one. The elementary version of compensation theorem can be appreciated if we take a simple circuit. We first take an example. Suppose we have a battery E, a resistance let us say R and the resistance R1. Okay. The current through the circuit is capital I. Then as far as capital R is concerned, as far as capital R is concerned, we could replace capital R1 that is the rest of the circuit. You see our, we, we concentrate our attention on this element R. Okay. The rest of the circuit contains a voltage source E and a resistance R1 in which a current I flows. The drop across R1 is I times R1. Now, if I if I draw a circuit like this R and a voltage source here which is equal to I R1 all right, an ideal voltage source then the rest of the circuit that is the element R that we have been considering does the current change here? No. Current or voltage drop? No, nothing happens all right and therefore, the compensation theorem states or this is an example of compensation theorem. It states that any element in a linear time invariant passive reciprocal network LLFPB network any element can be replaced by a voltage generator whose voltage is equal to the potential drop across the element that is as simple as that. All right. This is the compensation theorem. As far as the rest of the circuit is concerned, it does not matter. So can you just repeat it once? Yes. In a LLFPB network, any element can be replaced by a voltage generator equal to the drop across the element. All right. We are going to use this. There is a second form of compensation theorem which we shall illustrate, which we shall enunciate only if we need it at a later point of time. And that relates to, you should know this at least that the second form of compensation theorem relates to a change in an element. For example, if this element R1 changes to R1 plus delta R1, all right, let me state it at least once for all you, you know this. If R1 changes to R1 plus delta R1, then the effect of delta R1 change can be due to temperature, can be due to humidity, can be due to aging and all kinds 1 K resistor may become 990 ohms. Okay. So, the effect of delta R1 as far as the rest of the circuit is concerned can be represented by an equivalent voltage generator whose voltage is equal to capital I the current flowing through it multiplied by delta R1. It is a very similar form, but while our simple one elementary one concerns the total potential drop, the second form concerns only the incremental drop and that is how uh, second form of the compensation theorem is used in sensitivity studies. That is, if, a, if an element changes by a small amount 10 percent, what is the effect on the rest of the circuit? All right. The second form you, we might require, if we require then we shall go into more details. But the first form simply is that if you have an element current flowing through it, then this element as far as the rest of the circuit is concerned can be replaced by voltage generator. 
an ideal voltage generator whose voltage is equal to the drop across the voltage drop across the element all right we shall use this so what if e was changed then we will change the voltage what if e was changed no rest of the circuit remains the same you see it is a network analysis problem in which the effect of any element can be replaced by a voltage generator nothing else changes e does not if e changes of course the current changes so, but if r1 changes then i will also change yeah, but that can be taken care of. This is why I am saying the second form is slightly more involved. We will not enter into a proof of that, but the second form I changes, but to keep I constant, an equivalent voltage source can be added, delta R1, as far as the rest of the circuit is concerned. That means the current I, the new current I shall be obtained by considering the change in delta R1 as equal to a voltage source whose drop is the previous current okay, multiplied by delta R1. So, could we use a current source? Uh, could we use a current source? Yes, composition theorem could also be stated in terms of a current source. Yes, it's true. So, in this case uh, increase in or changing R1 mm. would also affect I. So, the that's what that is what the question was. So, what the second from the compensation theorem states that the new current in the rest of the circuit can be taken care of by an equivalent voltage generator whose value is equal to delta R1 multiplied by the previous current. Mm -hmm. All right, this is how the, the uh, compensation theorem becomes important. But as I said, we shall look into that in more details when you come to the to the point. At the present time, we shall only use this particular form that any element can be replaced by a voltage generator equal to the drop across this. So, won't this require that delta R1 tends to 0? Hmm. We are not considering that form at all. So, do not consider this as a result of the second form of compensation theorem. No, this is an elementary compensation theorem. Forget about delta R1 now. Delta R1, I simply mentioned that you should be aware that the compensation theorem has a second form. We shall deal with that later. Okay? So, L and C can also be same LDI. Any, any, any element. I simply said uh, with respect to resistance, but any element Z, if a current I flows, then for the rest of, as far as the rest of the circuit is concerned, it can be replaced by a voltage source whose voltage is equal to I times Z with the same polarity. Okay? That is equal to the drop. We shall use the compensation theorem in proving, in proving Thevenin's theorem. I am sure you are acquainted with the statement of Thevenin's theorem, but we will prove it <coughs> in this class. I do not think it was proved, it might have been verified taking a resistive network or some other network, but proof requires the help of the compensation theorem. Well, as you know, the statement of the Thevenin's theorem is that if you have a network N having N number of voltage sources and n number of current sources, this is how we indicate a network n, linear, passive, reciprocal, etcetera, etcetera, <coughs> not passive because it contains active sources. So, a general linear network containing n v, uh, containing n number of voltage sources and n number of current sources, that is what we indicate by n v and m i, which delivers current or power to a load Z L to a load Z L. Now, we are being uh, <coughs> quite general and we are working in the frequency domain, the S domain, no, no longer in the time domain. Capital N may contain linear elements only, linear bilateral elements. Capital N may also contain voltage sources, current sources. It may contain controlled sources also that is a source whose current or voltage is controlled by some other some other voltage or current. But the only thing that is barred is that the load and the network the load is a, is a typical element in the whole network it is a typical element we are interested in finding out the current that flows through the load all right we are interested in finding the current through any element which we call the load. The only restriction is that Z L and N 
must not have any magnetic coupling. No magnetic coupling, no m between z l and n. This is the only restriction. Then Thevenin's theorem states that as far as this is very important, no mutual inductance. There cannot, there cannot be any magnetic coupling. When the Thevenin's theorem states that as far as the load current is concerned, capital I, the whole network can be replaced by an equivalent voltage source V T, capital T for Thevenin in series with an equivalent impedance Z T, again T for Thevenin, all right. It states that this is equivalent to this simple network. The current in this circuit, the current in the load shall be the same. This is the statement of Thevenin's theorem. Where now we shall have to specify what V T and Z T are, all right. Thevenin's theorem states that the whole network N can be replaced in so far as the current through ZL is concerned. The whole network can be replaced by an equivalent voltage source VT and in series with an, with an equivalent impedance, the Thevenin impedance ZT, all right. The value of VT as, as you know is the open circuit voltage across N. That is if ZL is open circuited, the current is made equal to 0, then the voltage that appears here is the VT. So, VT sometimes is written as VOC open circuit and ZT that is more important, ZT is the impedance looking back into the network. Now, let me draw this capital M N V M I this is Vt open circuit no current flows and as far as Zt is concerned it is the it is the impedance looking back into the network with the voltage sources and current sources killed or inactivated that is Inactivation means that voltage sources if they are ideal, they are replaced by short circuits, okay. Ideal voltage sources are replaced by short circuits and ideal current sources are replaced by open circuits. This is what killing the sources means. A point of caution, controlled sources cannot be touched, controlled sources must be left as they are controlled sources. Controlled sources are sources whose current or voltage is controlled by another current or voltage in the circuit. Okay. So, we cannot do, we cannot neither open it or you neither open it nor close it nor short circuit it, you just leave them untouched, all right. Controlled sources, this point is extremely important. No controlled sources should be touched only independent sources that is voltage generators whose voltage does not depend on any other current or voltage in the circuit. Current generator whose current is does not depend on any other current or voltage in the circuit. Only those have to be replaced like this ideal <coughs> voltage sources short circuited, ideal current sources open circuited. If they are not ideal, if they are not ideal then replace them by their equivalent internal impedances. All right. Yeah. So could you give an example of control sources? Ah, I will. I will. But first, let me uh, let me take control sources out of the picture first, and let me first prove Thevenin's theorem. Then I'll go to an example of control sources. Sir, yeah. In the case of magnetic coupling, can't be replaced just by three electrons. Provided it is a three-terminal network, you cannot change the physical structure of the network. Then you are changing everything. If it is a three terminal network, what he is saying is if I have a load which is magnetically coupled, can I draw an equivalent circuit? Yes, you can draw an equivalent circuit provided you do not destroy the architecture, architectural niceties or peculiarities of the structure. If it is a four terminal network, you should leave it four terminal. If you can find an equivalent circuit, perfectly all, not otherwise, okay. Now, the proof of Thevenin's theorem proceeds like this. We have the network m number of current sources, n number of voltage sources, 
and we have the load ZL okay this current is I okay so what we do is <coughs> what we do is now we use compensation theorem to find the current I to find the current I we replace ZL by an equivalent voltage source okay in other words this would be equivalent to capital M M I N V then a voltage source whose value is I times Z L alright and this current is I agreed. The current I now we invoke linearity the current I therefore is a result of source phase internal to N and this source I times Z L the current I is a result of sources internal to the network and this source and therefore I can find them independently and apply the principle of superposition. In other words capital I shall be equal to I1 plus I2 where I1 is the current that flows due to n number of current sources and n number of voltage sources internal to capital N with, with the second source inactivated inactivated means it should be replaced by short a short circuit. circuit all right and therefore the interpretation of i1 is that i have m i n v this is i1 i1 is therefore equal to i s c we call this short circuited current i s c and the effect of i z l effect of i z l that is i to find out I2 to find out I2 what we do is what we do is we kill these sources we kill these sources all right we kill these sources and then what would be if we kill these sources the current that flows is equal to I2 all right. Now I2 obviously <coughs> would be equal to what is this impedance if I look into the network Z, Z T okay Z subscript T this is the Thevenin equivalent impedance therefore I2 would be equal to I Z L this voltage source divided by Z T but with a negative sign that is correct with a negative sign because I2 opposes IZL. IZL tends to send the current into the network whereas I2 has been shown out of the network coming out of the network therefore I2 is equal to this and therefore my capital I which is the result which is the addition of the two the current I therefore becomes equal to I1 plus I2 which is equal to I S C plus not plus minus I Z L divided by Z T. Okay. Now this should be I have made a mistake it is ok all right we call this now as equal to V some voltage V I Z L equal to V all right now I can uh, <coughs> this equation should be valid and do something which you should understand now. I have decoupled now the current I from the voltage V. It was an independent voltage source V Z V okay. Now this equation should be valid even if I open the load that is if I make I equal to 0 then this equation should be valid and if I make I equal to 0 then I S C minus 
the V that I shall get now is the open circuit voltage that is VOC divided by ZT. Is that clear? Is this clear? Okay. ISC should be equal to instead of V I will write open circuited voltage that VOC by ZT. Ah, that is the question. V is a function of I, but V will exist even if I equal to 0. So what we have taken Under that condition, you see VOC is not in general equal to V. In general, no. VOC is the special value. This is the beauty of the compensation theorem. That as far as the rest of the circuit is concerned, you can replace it by voltage generator. Now, you disconnect the component. The voltage generator remains, but it becomes the open circuit voltage. That is, it draws no current from the load. All right, this is the application of the compensation theorem. And therefore, ISC equal to VOC by ZT. Now, let us go back to the equation that is what I get is I equal to ISC minus IZL by ZT and ISC is equal to VOC divided by ZT minus IZL divided by ZT and therefore I 1 plus ZL by ZT is equal to VOC by ZT and therefore I equals to VOC divided by ZL plus ZT and that proves Thevenin's theorem. That is as far as the current is concerned, current is given by a voltage source VOC then a series combination of ZT and ZL. Okay. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Can you explain the explanation for replacing the voltage source by an open circuit first? Okay. <coughs> oh, the compensation theorem. Sir, you replace the compensated voltage source by an open circuit. I did not replace it by voltage circuit. What I said was this is a voltage generator, capital V. Now, capital V exists even if I becomes equal to 0. Under that condition, we call it VOC. Okay? You see, the network contains voltage sources and current sources and therefore, if the load is infinite, even then a voltage exists and that voltage we are calling VOC. All right. Because I is equal to 0, the voltage is not 0. The voltage I V equal to I Z L is a general condition, but when I equal to 0, the voltage V assumes a value which is equal to V O C. It is not 0. All right. Is that clear? Okay. Let us take, let us take a simple example. If I have a battery, same, same R R 1. Okay. The voltage here is I R 1. Now, if I, dip, if I open circuit this, the voltage was I times R 1. I becomes equal to 0, but R 1 becomes infinite. The product can still be finite and that product we have called V O C. Is that clear? We have not violated any condition. Z L becomes infinity, capital I becomes 0, the product of 0 and infinity can still be a finite quantity and that is what if you measure here obviously it will be equal to the battery all right and therefore the product can still remain finite now thevenin's theorem therefore states that as far as the current in a particular element in the network is concerned consider that element as a load find out the equivalent thevenin source which is equal to the open circuit voltage and the equivalent Thevenin impedance which is the impedance looking back into the network with independent sources replaced by their internal impedances. Independent is an important word. Now, we will illustrate with the help of two examples the application of Thevenin's theorem to a situation where there are no independent, where there are no dependent sources and to another situation where there are dependent sources. Let us look at them. If there is a dependent source and there is a resistor, 
and we are seeing into the circuit then what will be the resistance say it again so there is an independent source and there is a resistor and we are looking uh, into the circuit for calcul- calculating the thevenin's resistance correct so what will be the resistance it will be the resistance only if it is a voltage source independent voltage source what you are saying is if i am looking at this yeah to calculate the thevenin equivalent impedance it will be simply equal to this resistance no so it is con- uh, controlled source that is okay. if it is controlled source then obviously this source is controlled by another voltage or current you should be find out that voltage that will be apparent when you do the exam okay let's take two examples i am proceeding very slow because thevenin's theorem is one of the one of the most important theorems and usually we don't prove it in the class you know we, we simply state it and apply it at the most we verify it this is the first time i gave a proof so <coughs> let me proceed carefully with an example two examples as i said <coughs> the first example is example 7.3 in the textbook where we have a current source 5 delta t a 1/3 farad capacitor then we have a 4 ohm resistor and a 1 henry inductance it contains resistance inductance and capacitance and it is this current i of t which has to be found out by application of thevenin's theorem therefore thevenin's theorem as far as thevenin's theorem is concerned this is my zl 4 ohm and 1 henry and this is the rest of the network n which contains one current source zero voltage sources okay <coughs> now obviously if i open circuit this if i open circuit this if i remove that the whole current will flow through one third farad capacitor and if i go back to my uh, to my transform domain then i have the voltage source would be 5 times 5 times 1 by 3 three by, 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 by s 3 by s so it is 15 by, by s that would be the voltage sir okay the the transform of this is 5 and this the impedance of this is 3 by s and therefore this current flows through 3 by s and therefore the voltage source is 15 by s then the impedance looking back obviously the current source has to be opened and therefore the impedance is simply 1/3 farad capacitor and then we have the 4 ohm and 1 henry inductor and this is the current it becomes a single loop equation i should write capital i and so it's very easy to find out what capital i is let's put it <coughs> capital i should be simply equal to 15 divided by s divided by 3 by s from the capacitor plus 4 plus inductance s so that is equal to 15 divided by s squared plus 4s plus 3 that is 15 divided by s plus 1 s plus 3 okay which i can write as uh, or you can break it into partial fraction and the final result is 15 by 2 my solution e to the minus e t minus e to the minus 3t times e t from this step going here is routine there is nothing nothing very brilliant about it okay i have found out i of t a question that can arise here i have taken this example intentionally <coughs> to raise this question let's see if that if that question has arisen yet in any any of the minds What i intentionally that? took this problem in order to get a question from the students i didn't say anything about the initial conditions in the circuit i went straight ahead with laplace domain in other words i assumed that initial conditions are zero I didn't assume a VC zero minus. I didn't assume a IL of zero minus. So the question that should arise at this moment, I expected, is Thevenin's theorem valid only for initially relaxed circuits? No. no sir. The answer is no. 
you can take care of the initial initial conditions in exactly the same manner as voltage sources and current sources and independent voltage sources and current sources okay i will take the second example to illustrate that particular point and fairly uh, <coughs> fairly involved example let us say we have a v of t and then a switch which opens at t equal to 0 which closes at t equal to 0 we have an inductor L1, the current is I1, I1 of 0 minus <coughs> is not equal to 0, it is given, I1 of 0 minus is given. Then a capacitor C, the voltage across which is Vc, Vc of 0 minus is also given, it is not equal to 0. Let us make it quite general. Then we have another inductor L2 in which the current is I2 and I2 of 0 minus is also not equal to 0. And finally, we have a resistance R whose value the voltage across which is V0T and it is it is V0T which you have to find. It is this resistance, it is this voltage that you have to find out. That is this is the load by application of Thevenin's theorem. Well, <coughs> The first thing you do is to draw an equivalent circuit <coughs> in the frequency domain, equivalent circuit in the frequency domain and it will look like this. If you proceed carefully, uh, <coughs> it will look like this that is you shall have, <coughs> let me draw it separately, you shall have a V of S, V of S which is the Laplace transform of V T multiplied by ut okay because the switch was closed then as far as the inductor l1 is concerned its initial conditions can be taken care of by a voltage source in opposition minus l i of 0 minus so it would be minus plus l i 1 0 minus is that okay then an inductor l whose impedance is sl this takes care of the of the inductor L1. <coughs> the capacitor can be taken care of by a relaxed capacitor in series with a voltage source, opposition or for, for okay, plus minus, and this would be V sub C zero minus. All right. The third inductor can be similarly taken care of by the inductor L2 in series with a voltage source which would be in opposition that is this would be L2 I2 0 minus and this is what the network N is. This is <coughs> to these points shall be connected the resistance R and this is V0 of S. Okay. What we have to find out is VOC and the impedance Z T. Okay. Now, <coughs> to simplify matters, to simplify matters, let us call, let us call this voltage as V 1, let us call this voltage as V 2 and this voltage as V 3. Okay. Then, is V T obvious? I do not have to write in a loop equation or node equation, you see what, how, how I do by observation. <coughs> you see V t, V t obviously will be this voltage, this voltage minus or plus, plus V 3, okay. this voltage plus V 3 and if you open circuit this, no current flows in L 2 All right, and therefore current only flows in this loop. If I open circuit this that is R is removed, you remove R, then this voltage, what will be this voltage? The current in this circuit, the current in this loop shall be V plus V1 minus V2 divided by okay, V plus V1 minus V2, this is C, <coughs> divided by S L1 plus 1 over S C, agreed? This will be the current. So, the drop in C 
shall be this multiplied by 1 over SC okay, and this drop adds to V2 okay, this will be the voltage here then plus V3 this will be V2 is that clear? This is step by step observation but very careful observation not seeing there is a difference between seeing and observing. Seeing is what Watson used to do and observing is what Sherlock Holmes used to do. Have you read Sherlock Holmes? Arthur Conan Doyle? Okay. Holmes always used to say Watson you do not you only see you do not observe you have to observe here and a very systematic observation. Okay. Is this clear that V t can be written down by inspection? Similarly, Z t can also be written down by inspection. For finding Z t, you short circuit this, you short circuit this, you short circuit this, you short circuit this, because they are all voltage sources and independent voltage sources. And therefore, Z t would be simply S L 2 plus 1 over S C in parallel with S L 1. And once you have found out Vt, Zt, you can now find out the current in R or the voltage across R. The voltage across R V0 would be simply Vt divided by Zt plus R multiplied by R. That is all. You see a fairly uh, complicated circuit, a two mesh circuit solved by inspection. You did not have to write mesh equations, you did not have to write node equation. This is the beauty of Thevenin's theorem that if you do not want the currents and voltages in all the branches of the network, it is only one branch, then you can avoid writing those messy mesh equations okay, or nodal equations. You can simply apply Thevenin's theorem and most of the time the result will come out by inspection. I did not I didn't solve any equation here, I just wrote down by inspection. Okay, this is the beauty of Thevenin's theorem. So, Thevenin's theorem can be applied can be applied to networks containing initial conditions, there is no problem. All right. This is in the frequency domain. This is in the frequency domain. Yes. That uh, in the time domain you will have to write the corresponding equations of the time. You will have to solve the differential equations. So, is that required? This is not required if you are good in frequency domain. So, can you leave it like this? The output is no, you have to invert it. After you find out V0, you have to find out V0, small V0 of t. Yes. But you see, the, the beauty of the frequency domain is you do not handle any differential equation. All equations are algebraic. Okay. Now, let us take the another example in which there is a control source. And the most common example is that of a uh, transistor. A transistor amplifier, let us say uh, with an emitter resistor to make things complicated, which is unbypassed. Okay. So, the equivalent circuit, I am talking of a, <coughs> a circuit like this. The signal source is here, of course, there are coupling capacitors, and the output is, let us say, taken here this is plus VCC. Let us take a simple transistor amplifier with this unbypassed, the emitter resistor unbypassed. Then the equivalent circuit if this is let us say R sub C, the equivalent circuit is <coughs> the following. You have Rx the base spreading resistance, the input source let us say Vi going to ground we call this as ground we ignore the biasing resistors we in we think that they are we consider them to be large compared to r pi are you acquainted with these symbols yes. okay and we ignore we make low frequency analysis we ignore the internal capacitances so let us say this voltage is v then as you know this is the emitter 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 terminal from which goes a source uh, goes a resistance Re okay. and this current source is GMV between the collector and the emitter. 
and between the collector and the emitter you also have the internal resistance of the transistor which is fairly large R0 or maybe you have ignored it so far ok we can ignore it alright let us ignore it to make life simple. Then you have the resistor R sub C which goes to ground and this is V out. Suppose we want to solve this circuit by Thevenin's theorem, by Thevenin's theorem alright. Then what we have to do is we, we open circuit R C, find out V O C here. In finding out V O C of course there is no problem ok. Finding out V O C. So what is this R Z said exactly? What is R 0? R 0 is the collector to emitter resistance. So R Z, I assume this is the source voltage. Oh R X, R X is the base spreading resistor that is between the base and the internal base B prime. There is a small resistance of the order of tens of ohms, 10 to 100 ohms that also is sometimes ignored. But what I am pointing out is in the analysis of this circuit which you have done by mesh analysis or node analysis you could also do by Thevenin by simply open circuit in this finding out the voltage here and then to find out Z T to find out Z T you do not kill this source. What you do is you kill this source V i but not this one this must be left intact. To find out what this source is you have to find V that is the drop across drop across R pi and the simplest simplification would be that if this source is killed then R pi and R x come in series to the ground and therefore what you have to do is a current source G m V goes into two resistances one is R e and the other is R x and R pi. So the drop across R pi that would be capital V and then you can find out what the impedance here is. Is that clear? You find out V, you find out GMV, then therefore from the impedance consideration the value of V, V shall disappear. It will be simply an impedance. Is that okay or you want me to work this out? Okay. I wanted to avoid that but let us let us do it, it does not matter. There is a GMV then an RE, then an RE and in parallel I have R pi and R x and this voltage is V with you must be careful about the polarity uh, this is minus and this is plus ok. I am trying to find out the impedance looking here ok. Now since this current source how do I do that? Since there is a current source here let me use a current source here capital I uh, G and then what you have to find out is V G. The impedance looking back would be V G divided by I G. Obviously I G is equal to G M V and <coughs> why so how do I find out the impedance looking here? I connect a source here and find out the response. I could connect a voltage source, find the current or I connect a current source, find the voltage. Now since there is in series a current source, I use a current source that is the simplest thing to do. So my ZT shall be equal to VG divided by IG and this is IG is equal to GMV alright. <coughs> now this current, this current obviously shall be GMV multiplied by RE divided by RE plus RX plus R pi ok. And this current multiplied by R pi is equal to V, no. <laughs> it is it is equal to minus, minus v all right so <coughs> now what is uh, 
I know IG is GMV and the drop How do I find out this drop? This drop is? That is where I needed this. This drop is not 0 across the GMV. It has become a degenerate case now. This is why I needed that R0. You remember R0 we had ignored? If I have an R0, then it is easy to find out this drop. Okay? But let us leave it to you. I do not want to spend time on this calculation. You, I set this as an assignment to you. You have done this earlier, you have done this by the different method, by using the uh, mesh analysis or node analysis, but it can be done. Okay. I have told you sufficient details about it. Even if R0 is not there, even if R0 is absent, one can calculate, there is no problem. Find out the short circuit current and then find ZT by V open circuit by short. Okay, okay, that is an easier method, yes. But you require to calculate ZT. Okay. okay, you can do that. ZT you can calculate as VOC by ISC short circuit. How would you find VOC? Open circuit this, the source is there, find out the output voltage. Find the voltage of across the current source. Pardon me? Control current source. Yes. What is the voltage of across the current source? Well, that will be determined by the rest of the circuit. There, you see, when you calculate VOC, this is not absent, this is still there. Sir, but say if we open circuit it, we will not get any GMV, any current in that branch. If we open circuit this, we shall not get a current here. Okay. So, that is a clue. Yes sir, the voltage drop across R e is equal to the voltage drop. Quite so. Okay, those simplifications you look at them. It is not a difficult task. Okay, uh, the rest of the time I have uh, another 5 minutes. <coughs> the rest of the time I want to uh, talk about the Norton's theorem. As you know Norton's theorem is the dual. I have told you once and I repeat, I will not tell you this again. But take me seriously and I leave something to you, do work it out. <laughs> okay. Norton's theorem says, <coughs> the statement is that it is exactly the dual of Friedman's theorem. It says that as far as n with n number of current sources, n number of voltage sources, as far as the current in a load is concerned, I the <coughs> the network can be replaced by an equivalent current source I n in parallel with an impedance Z n and then Z L. This current is I, where I n is the short circuit current that is I n is I S C. Okay and Z n is the same as Z t, Z n is the same as Z t. And this Norton's theorem can be proved very simply if you have proved Thevenin's theorem. That is we proceed indirectly from Thevenin's to Norton's. Now Thevenin's theorem says that the current I is equal to V t divided by Z t plus Z L <coughs> which I can write as V t by Z t look at this proof 1 plus Z L by Z t and this I can write as V t by Z t times Z t divided by Z t plus Z L which means that the current would be given by a current source V t by Z t divided between Z t and Z L. This will be the current I and agreed? this equation says that there is a current source V t by Z t which splits into two currents. 
and the current through the load is Z T divided by Z T plus Z L. This is the current division theorem. Okay. Now, if you compare this with the Norton's equivalent circuit, obviously I M is nothing but V T by Z T, which is equal to I S C, the short circuit current, and Z N, the Norton equivalent impedance. Usually, it's stated in terms of admittance, but we can work in terms of impedance. There is no problem. So, Norton equivalent impedance would be simply equal to the Thickman <coughs> equivalent impedance. Okay, and the current in the load is the same. And therefore, whether it is Thevenin or Norton, they are duals of each other. They are tools in your hand for simplification of a circuit. And I repeat, this is applicable. This is a great advantage when you do not require currents and voltages in all the branches of the network. You require just one or two. Then Thevenin theorem, Thevenin's theorem, or Norton's theorem comes to a rescue. I shall close this class with a problem. <coughs> you have uh, done in 110 oscillator circuits, you have the phase shift oscillator, no, okay. does not matter whether you have done or not it does not matter. I have three identical sections R C R C R C. I have connected a voltage source V i here and I am interested in finding out the voltage V o here okay. V o by V V i this is the function network function that I want to find out obviously in the Laplace domain all capacitors are initially relaxed and you have to find out the frequency at which V0 by Vi this angle is equal to pi that is there 180 degrees out of phase. At this frequency what is V0 by Vi? What is the value? and I want you to find this out. You see if you go by ordinary you understand the problem? Okay. If you go by ordinary analysis you will write 3 loop equations, 3 mesh equations and you have to solve for 3 by 3 determinant. Agree? Okay. If you write node equations again 1, 2, 3, 3 nodes, 3 by 3 determinant. But even here when, when I want to find out the network function, the individual currents in the el, in the elements are not important. I just want to find out the open circuit voltage here. Okay, even here, Thevenin's theorem comes to great help. You see, you apply Thevenin's theorem once here, then you get an equivalent source in series with an impedance, which is by inspection no solution of differential equation or algebraic equation, no, nothing. Then we apply Thevenin's theorem again here, second time. Then what you have? Then you have a simple one mesh, one loop circuit and therefore V0 can be obtained and you can do this analysis almost by inspection, careful inspection, okay. You have to observe, not see, agreed? I want you to solve this by application of Thevenin's theorem. We will see you again on Tuesday.